The cult of the self dominates our culture. This cult shares within it the classic traits of psychopaths, superficial charm, grandiosity, and self-importance, a need for constant stimulation, a penchant for lying, deception, and manipulation, and the incapacity for remorse or guilt. It is the misguided belief that wealth, fame, personal style, and personal advancement, mistaken for individualism, are the same as democratic equality. It is the celebration of image over substance. Fame and wealth are their own justification, their own morality. How one gets there is irrelevant. And as we sink into an economic and political morass, as we barrel toward a crisis that will create more misery than the Great Depression, we are controlled, manipulated, and distracted by a society awash in electronic hallucinations and social media. The consumer culture and the cult of the self are not designed simply to entertain. They are designed to drain us emotionally, confuse us about our identity, make us blame ourselves for our predicament, and condition us to choose the illusions of unachievable happiness and keep us from fighting back. I'm interviewed in the film, and I think one of the things I say in the film is that this is what happens with all dying cultures, that this is really about the cult of death. And when I went to divinity school, we were, all, we were taught that idols, the idol worship, begins with the consumption or the sacrifice of others, but always ends by your own sacrifice on the altar of idols. That's the danger of idolatry. And I, th I think that's what this film uh, very powerfully illustrates, is that a culture that kneels before these idols slays itself. Yeah, and I also loved your l words about the antidote to, the, to, to this apocalypse, because I, I made the film and the book because I felt like we were kind of barreling towards the apocalypse and that this was an unsustainable future. But I loved what you said about how authentic culture can provide us a way to think critically about what's around us. And that's really what this my work has been about, is having a way to deconstruct the culture around us so we can kind of see the matrix that we're in and hopefully have a little agency over it. Boston-born Lauren Greenfield has been exploring culture through photography and documentaries for more than 30 years. She also directed the HBO documentary Thin, which follows four women with eating disorders working toward recovery, beauty culture, a critical examination of beauty and pop culture, and the Queen of Versailles, about the owners of one of the largest and most expensive homes in the country till the crash of 08. In her latest film, Generation Wealth, Greenfield presents a visual history of our growing obsession with money, beauty, sex, and more which Variety calls a compelling argument for a society on the brink of decline. In a way, I started out thinking it was about money or thinking about it was a wealth or the image of that. And what I ended up seeing is you could also plug in the currency of beauty, the currency of youth, the currency of sexuality, the currency of fame, that we were addicted to all of these things that were unattainable and kind of comparing ourselves against ideas that were unattainable and that just kept us on this hamster wheel of addiction and, and i think you capture it a kind of a, a, right below the surface a kind of collective misery yeah it's almost like we all of the subjects in the film are searching for something that can't fill a kind of emptiness that comes from trauma we kind of learn in the film and so they're all kind of um, trying to get somewhere that they never get to. In the intro, we played the sound from that guy who said, uh, society's a mass greatest wealth at the moment they face death. Are you, look at the smile on your face. <laughs> are you predicting the collapse of our culture? Or, what are you, or are you just uh, issuing a warning? It's kind of a warning because I do think collapse is pos I mean, I do think we're headed on an unsustainable path. That what you see in the film is that we want more and more, that we're never satisfied, that we can't stop until we crash. And I think that's a dangerous path to be on.
The world's first gender-neutral gender clothing store has officially opened in New York City. And it's one of the first gender-neutral clothing stores in the world. And it's breaking barriers, one piece of clothing at a time. Everything we're doing is breaking a barrier. Every, we're looking at everything and turning it upside down and saying, why is this? Just because it's been this way doesn't mean it should continue to be this way. Breaking the binary. That's the motto that this New York store goes by. We do our very best to ask everybody what their pronoun is. So is it he, him, she, her, z, z, they, them? And from there, that makes people feel really comfortable in their shopping experience and knowing that there's going to be no judgment. Now Rob hopes to open up several more fluid stores around the world and he hopes to accomplish this within the next five years. What is it that brands do? What, are they, are we, I mean I think that, that people are seeking their identity in brands, that their identity is so eroded. I think that's exactly right, that they're looking to define themselves with these material things. I remember interviewing one teenager and she said, I'm Kate Spade and my friend is some other brand. It's almost like this fusion of material things and identity. And in a way, that's why I think it just continues to sow our insecurity because um, we can't really find ourselves in those ephemeral brands. And this, as the movie, as the film makes clear, has, has just seeped down to even the inner city, to every layer of American, right, well, there's, I mean, even yeah. global society. There's, what I saw in the culture in LA in the 90s and how kids were being affected had kind of spread like a virus right. to everybody. And I think with reality TV, with social media, this is no longer limited to LA. This is kind of our mode of comparison. Well, it's ubiquitous. So you see that it's really an irrational pathology and has nothing to do with the money or the weight or the youth that they're actually trying to get to. One of the things that is uh, kind of constant throughout the film is that no one ever has enough. No matter what they achieve, it reminds me of Proust. I don't know if you've read Proust, but you never achieve happiness because as soon as you, you have what you think is happy, um, there's always something glittering out there and, and, it, and, and in fact perpetuates uh, a deep unhappiness. I think that's something you hit several times. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the core of what the movie's about. and and. The, also kind of the core of capitalism, which sows this insecurity in all of us and then can sell us something to fix that only to find a new problem. I mean, in the film, one of the things that really struck me was talking to a Wall Street banker who said, everybody in finance has a number. And they say when they get to that number, they're out of the business. And they get to that number and it's not enough and they change the number. And that really resonated for me. You interview Florian... Hom, pronounce him? Florian was an amazing um, subject because he was the embodiment of greed. He looked up to Gordon Gecko. He became a hedge fund banker. He made $800 million. And then he fell. He was indicted for fraud. He, he was amazing for me in this film because he was kind of like the devil who becomes a truth teller. Smoking a very expensive cigar while you interview him. Smoking a cigar. On a big leather couch somewhere. Right? <laughs> he tells us that he was chasing the wrong god. Well, of course, this is the theme of King Lear. It's really when you're in the rain on the heath, no better than a beggar, that you understand. Um, and it feels like we might be in that time. <laughs> we're headed there. We're headed there. So the point is that this, this dynamic of not being thankful is, is, is really central to spiritual deception. It's the thing that makes us begin to go adrift and look for something else. And we begin to go searching for something else because almost a familiarity has bred a contempt or at least a lack of appreciation for what we have. How many things in life do we not appreciate until we don't have them anymore? But from Lot's point of view, he saw himself simply just moving up the ladder of success. And one of the things that I came to discover in my own life is that sometimes being successful is not safe. <laughs> There's something happens to you when you become known and become a, 
personality and, and you know, it just changes not only the way that people see you and treat you, it changes how you see yourself and how you relate to other people. It creates a heart of arrogance. I mean, maybe Righteous Lot imagined that he could correct the immorality. I think that that's most people who go into politics think, well, I'm going to go there, I'm going to make a difference. And I'm sad to say that the vast majority end up not making a difference, but just becoming different. There's something about sitting in that pool of, of corruption that kind of makes you part of that system after a while. It's an easy rationalization. Well, you know, this is the way you have to do it. This is the way the game is played. You have to make some compromises, and the art of politics is compromise, and you've got to give a little if you want to get a little, and you go through this, and suddenly you stop being a person of principle. You stop being a person of focus and purpose and you just begin to take on the very atmosphere of the world that you're part of. I'm not saying people aren't called to that. There are those people who are like Daniel, and Daniel is an amazing example because he managed to stand apart from an equally corrupt culture that he was thrust into. But the difference was that Daniel didn't choose to go to Babylon. He was taken there as a captive. And he went there determined not to become what he saw as being the evidence of evil. And because of that, God's grace was so powerfully upon him. But the simple reality is that we are always going from one thing to another, and it's important to recognize the value of the moment we're in, not just simply looking to the future and hoping for something better or looking back to the past and wishing we could relive the past. Right now is, is the moment that God has you in. And the things that he's doing in your life exceed even your observation. But nonetheless, he wants us to be people who are constantly, continually, purposely grateful for what we have. He knew what he was going back into, and he just went back because there was a certain satisfaction. There was a certain ambition in his heart. In a way, Lot is emblematic of what Revelation 3.16 talks about as the the lukewarm Christian, the one who is neither hot, he's neither cold, therefore he's not a threat to anyone, you know, and certainly not a threat to the kingdom of darkness, to the devil. It reminds me of the seed of the parable of the sower when he talks about that seed that was planted in good soil, but it's choked off by the cares and the affairs and the riches and the seeking of the pleasures and the desires of the pleasures of this world.